Coming up next, a legendary singer tells us the definitive story of one of the most famous and beloved songs of all time. I'm telling you, great story here. First of all, the singer who made this song famous, she worked as a secretary for the record label. One of her duties was singing the lyrics to new songs on the tapes that would be dispersed to recording artists so they could learn the lyrics of the songs. This led to her getting a shot at singing backup. One day, one of the most famous singers ever gave her a chance to record his new song. Everybody knew this was gonna be a hit. When she recorded it though, her first take, it was perfect. I mean, everybody in the recording session was cheering, excited to know that she'd nailed the record. Only problem is the engineer forgot to turn on the tape. She was pretty pissed, which led to the next take having some relish on it, made it even better. Up next, this legendary singer tells us the rest of the story and how this song became a true standard on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you ever saved up your allowance to buy a 45 single, a cassette single, an eight track or a maxi single, you're gonna dig this channel of deep musical nostalgia. Make sure to subscribe below right now. Click the big red button, click the bell so you always know when our latest interviews and videos come out. Also check us out on Patreon. So it's time for another edition of our show, Revelations, where featured artists share rare stories behind their greatest songs and their greatest albums. Truly insight you won't find anywhere else. Today, we have the story of a song that may be the most famous number two hit of the entire 60s. It's a song that's been remade by everybody from Van Halen to David Bowie and Mick Jagger. A lot of people have remade this song. I'm talking about the classic hit, co-written by none other than Marvin Gaye, Dancing in the Street by Martha and the Vandellas. This song was written by Marvin Gaye, as I said, as well as Ivy Joe Hunter and William Mickey Stevenson. Uh, the idea came during the biggest impact of the civil rights movement in the 60s. So let's set the scene. Mickey and Marvin were riding around Motown, the Detroit city, and see an open fire hydrant spraying water in the streets. So the kids would cool off during the hot summer and it looked like everybody was dancing in the street. They mentioned many cities in the song from Chicago to New York, to Washington DC, to Philadelphia, to their own Detroit city. Uh, but many felt the song was a call out for people to demonstrate in the streets as those were the places where uh, you know, there had previously been unrest and, and that kind of thing. Martha Reeves, who sang lead, was a secretary at Motown. She was also an up and coming singer. One of her duties was to sing the lyrics for the backup singers on the tape so they could learn the songs. This impressed executives and before she knew it, she was singing backup to legendary artists, including Marvin Gaye. Marvin knew when Dancing in the Street was finished that it'd be a big hit. He also knew that Martha Reeves would be the perfect interpreter of his song. Actually, Marvin was the first to record it, and according to Martha, he'd put a real smooth vocal on it. More of a jazzy feel to it. But Martha wanted to sing it differently. Her approach was gonna be monumentally different. She wanted to put some mustard on it. So when she did her first take, she nailed it. Everybody was cheering in the studio knowing that that was the record. The only problem was the engineer on the session, a guy named Lawrence Horn, he reluctantly admitted he'd forgotten to record it. So Martha's perfect take, that went down the toilet. So when Martha sang it again, her second take, it had some anger on it, some frustration. Somehow it was even better. Another cool story about this session was that Ivy Joe Hunter, uh, one of the co-writers of the song and also a producer at Motown, I mean, he was crazy about the recording by Martha, with the exception of the drum track. He didn't like that. He felt it needed a, a little bump and grind. So he ran out to his car and he grabbed a crowbar of all things. So he sat there on the concrete floor while they were recording with the crowbar and he had him press record again and he added a new sound. He slammed the crowbar against the concrete on the downbeat to create one of the most distinctive drum beats in rock history. So let's get into the interview with Martha Reeves, truly a legend. She has a lot more insight and more stories to add. As we get into this interview, I do want to thank our sponsor, Zenny. I wear the glasses I wear every single day on here. Love them. You can get a pair for every day of the week because they're so cost effective, so quality. I'm telling you, you'll be a customer for life. Just click on the link right up here, our info button, 
or the link below to get yours today. Get up to 80% off regular retail prices. Here's Martha Reeves with the story. Everybody loved what they were doing and the writers were hot. They were coming up with some of the most fantastic things for every artist, every artist. And yeah. it, was, it was a competition as to who would get the records from the top producers at the time. The a and department was directly across from Studio A. So I went over and I peeped in there and there was this beautiful man, Marvin Gaye, standing up on the <laughs> mic singing a song called Dancing in the Street. He was singing it as if he was singing to his woman, calling out around the world, are you ready for a brand new beat, baby? One of Marvin's things, you know, he called everybody baby or honey, because he didn't want to remember, remember your name. Follow him around and, oh, Marvin, and he said, yeah, honey, yeah, baby. He would never call you by your name. <laughs> anyway, he was standing there singing this song, and, and he looked over and saw me just, I guess I was in ecstasy just watching him sing. He said, hey, man, let's try this song on Martha. That was Ivy Hunter and William Stevenson, the co-writers of Dancing in the Street. It was thrilling because the intro sounded like the bullfights. So get up, uh, dance or something. And uh, he was standing there singing it and asked me if I would sing it. I had heard him sing it twice. I'd almost remembered it, but I couldn't feel it the way he was feeling all romantic and stuff. So I asked him if I could sing it the way I feel it. So I thought about how we danced in the street when I was a child, maybe 11 or 12 years old. I, my dad, working for the city of Detroit, asked the police department to block our street off. Look, maybe just one block, Cobblestone Street, mm -hmm. maybe about 12 houses on the whole street. And we could dance on Saturday night so that no cars would hit us or anything. No trucks could come through there. We had the whole block um, to dance and party. And I thought about that. And that's how, what I came up with. Calling out around the world, are you ready? Because the neighborhood would rally yeah. on Saturday. And we would party. They even roasted a goat one, one, one Saturday. And everybody got, I didn't eat any because I saw them destroy that thing. <laughs> I, I, I don't eat meat to this day because of that. But we, wow. we had a good time. We had a good time on Saturdays in our neighborhood. Everybody got along, no fights, you know, no reason to, to, to nobody had anything. We would eat each other's food, you know, uh, we just partied. And that's what I thought about singing Dancing in the Street. Mm. It was sort of disappointing when people uh, wanted to say it was a rally to riot. Right. That it was, to, for, you know, to cause people to get in an uprage. Uh, state of mind and, and, and go and destroy each other's properties and fight and, with racism and everything. All It wasn't that. It was an inclusive song. Yes, it was. About everybody having a great time. Just have a good time. And the lyrics speak to that. The lyrics attest to the fact that it, no matter what you wear, and it didn't, we didn't have anything, didn't matter what we could go barefoot even on this cobblestone street. You know, we just, we just had a good time. With joy. And that's what the music thinks, brings to me, to my heart, the joy of just dancing. Well, let's talk about dancing in the street, really break it down, because I've been, I've been waiting 43 <laughs> years to ask you about this. One of my favorite Let's songs of all time. <laughs> it's just such an amazing song. It really is one of the definitive songs of Motown. If a thousand years from now, if you want to tell people about Motown and about America, it's one of those songs you play and say, this is it. I didn't have to tell you. I don't have to put it into words. <laughs> Listen to this song and you'll understand. Went to number two on the Hot 100. Kept off number one by Do Wah Diddy, right? <laughs> man for man. She looked good. Marvin Gaye, Mickey Stevenson, as you said, Ivory Joe Hunter. Ivory, Ivory Joe Hunter. Released on the Gordy label again. The song highlighted the concept of having a good time. Mickey Stevenson said something about that he, he got the idea, he was driving around and seeing, you know, kids uh, just dancing in, with the fire hydrant open, right? And seeing that, and that was kind of a lost art. You don't see that anymore, but I remember seeing that in yes. the 70s, early, you know, late 70s when I was growing up and mm -hmm. early 80s. It's 
especially in neighbor neighborhoods that there was no access to a swimming pool. He said it looked like people were like dancing in the in the water. The waves, yeah. I read that the Marvin Gaye came up with the title "Dancing in the Street." That's his song. That he came up with it. He, he said got, we he need got to the call help from he got the help from Ivy and Mickey. Yeah, it was Marvin's song. He was yeah. singing it. Oh yeah, he he did the demo. That's right. And his demo was a little bit more smooth and slower. Yeah. And like you said, you said, hey, can I, can I try my own little no, thing? No, no, I didn't do that. Marvin said, let's try this on Martha. I was just standing there Googling and wondering, if, <laughs> you know, could I just stand there? I didn't want to be, you know, pushed away because I was in the doorway as he was recording. And he looked over and saw me. I would never have wanted to sing a song after Marvin Gaye. Oh, no, what, what I, I meant did. is after he said, let's try this on Martha. I said, can I sing said, it my way? Yeah, 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 yeah. exactly. The way yep. I feel it. It was kind of a ballad when he was singing it, right? Yes, it was. A lot slower, right? I'd song. love to hear that version. Yeah, hey, but it was erased. We remember we were recording on a four track machine. That's before we got the eight or the 24 only we had the track machines. Yeah. <laughs> Well, there, there's always these rumors, and, and glad that we're putting them to rest, that they were going, going to have Kim Weston singing. But I heard that wasn't true. That, no. that, that actually no, was no. a rumor that somebody started. I have to, to defend myself all the time and yeah. let people know. I um, was asked to sing three or four songs that Kim Weston was supposed to record and become mm -hmm. her recordings. But she had the misfortune of being the wife of William Stevenson, yeah. Mickey. So whenever they argued or something, he would give the songs to me. <laughs> <laughs> and I was sort of glad they didn't get along sometimes because I did a song called Love Makes Me Do Foolish Things. Love has made a fool of me. Holland Doja Holland had written it, but Mickey had recorded, being in our director, he had recorded his wife on it. They gave it to me. I sang it with all my heart. A song, My Baby Loves Me, that had the four tops and the andantes singing background like a choir. And Mickey asked me to sing it, and I did. <laughs> My baby loves me. And it, it, there's a song called Go Ahead and Laugh, the B-side, uh, that I thought I did a magnificent job I love that on, song. but Kim had sang it first. Go ahead and So I owe her a lot of love, but we were also at Miller High School with the same music teacher. I did two years at Miller High School and two years at Northeastern, because Northeastern turned into a parochial school and we had to go to another school. So Kim Weston and I were in the same choir. So, you know, that's my girl. I read a story that you had suggested that the lyrics were maybe a bit too repetitive, and that's where Ivory came in and changed up the song just a little bit to bring a little bit more musical composition to it. Is that true? Oh, I never objected to anything. Gotcha. Yeah, I wanted to clarify that because oh, I had read I that. Did, I, I didn't, didn't say sure. anything. He's just saying in the background. You yeah. can hear his voice back there with Betty and Rosalind. Well, recording session recorded in two takes, yeah. right? Tell me about that. The first take, I had learned the song listening to Marvin, so I gave it my what? They tell me Lawrence Horn didn't turn the machine on. The engineer looked at them and hey, man, they, were, they were all excited. They were giving each other high fives. Hey man, Chanel did this good song. I got a hit. <laughs> and then uh, Larry, Larry said, uh, uh, "Man, we didn't have the machine on." And can and Martha, can you do it again? Now I talked to Ivy later, and he said that that was a trick they played on me. But it's okay. Men have a different opinion of things, <laughs> and I've always known that there's an A side and a B side to our understanding. In our relationships, as far as music is concerned, me being the artist, the one who actually gave the soul and the inspiration to the song, I know what happened. That second time that you did it, I read that you were a little bit frustrated. I was and furious. So when you gave you that didn't. vocal, you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't. Did it. So I said, "Okay, I can do it again. Yeah. Can you do it? Again? Yes, I can." And so it was out any punching in. And a lot of artists will, will, will they'll admit that when they record a song, if they sing it and it's not quite what the producer wants to hear, they'll say, sing it again. And they call it punching in. Sing it and they'll punch you in where they want you to accelerate or whatever, get it right the way they want it. I had no punch ins. Or no dubs. No dubs. Yep. It was straight through like a live recording and that's what it sounds like. It does. And that's what it is.
There's that grit in there. Um, like you said, a little bit of anger in there. You were oh, in the moment and it had that. Yeah. Yeah. And inspired because they were also three good looking men <laughs> who had made me feel a little uneasy in the beginning. Because um, uh, I don't think that Ivy and uh, Mickey were ready for Marvin's statement because mm. they were anxious to get this hit on Marvin. He was the one. He was a man of the hour. They're looking for a hit for Marvin. And uh, this is after we had sang behind Marvin on Stubborn Kind of Fella, Hitchhike, Pride and Joy, his first album. We did the B-side. So Marvin was familiar with my vocals and evidently had confidence in me that I could do a good job on his song. Absolutely. So Ivy and, and Mickey went along with Marvin's request. The background vocals, tell me what you recall about that. Well, on Dancing in the Street, mm -hmm. the girls were singing it, Betty and Rosalind were singing it. And uh, Ivy kind of didn't think they were giving it the right punch at that. In the street, you know, you could hear him. He's actually louder than them on that punch, uh, that punch that you gave on on the line, and uh, the harmonies. He, he made them realize what the harmonies should sound like. It's sort of like there's some guys back there, but it's just one, just just uh, Ivy Hunter, and uh, it was wonderful. Two takes. Yeah. Just two. The iconic lyrics and how you sang them. I want to talk about that for a minute. Calling out around the world, are you ready for a brand new beat? I mean, one of the greatest opening lines of a song ever. And the way you sang that with, with that urgency, summer's here and the time is right for dancing in the street. I love your bravado. Like all we need is music, sweet music, and how you, you do the bravado on that. Was that just something in the moment you just... It was in the moment, that's what I felt. Yeah. And I asked them if I could sing it the way I felt it. And they said, okay, go ahead. And the, the second take was the take. That was it. Hunter or Ivy liked everything about the song when it was recorded, but he wasn't crazy about the drum beat. I just love this. This, this is so <laughs> Motown. He goes out, he wanted a little bit more bump and grind in it. So he goes out to his car and he gets a crowbar, right? And he goes down on the, on the, on the beat. And that was not hear? dancing in the street. Okay. That was nowhere to run. I read an interview though with, with Ivy where he said he did that on dancing in the street. The You don't hear that. Ksh. You don't hear that. Well, reference in other songs to Van Halen, you must have thought that was pretty cool. Oh, yeah. But then everybody remembers I'm from the South. I'm a country girl. So when people picked up on it, and especially from the country western era, I was thrilled. When Mick Jagger and David Bowie are covering the song, they took it to number one in the UK Make and then went to number Aid. seven here. Yeah, for Live Aid. I was so jealous though. When they did the, the musical video, I had a dress I could have worn mm -hmm. and I could dance better than both of them. <laughs> I was jealous they didn't let me do the video with them. Just incredible, David Bowie and, and Mick Jagger. And to me, like dancing in the street, that, that defining lyric in there is, all we need is music, sweet music. That was always what spoke to me. That's right. All we need is music. Hey, thanks so much for watching. Leave us a comment about this amazing song, Dancing in the Street. What do you think about the cheese ball <laughs> version between David Bowie and Mick Jagger, Van Halen's version, but of course, Martha Rees, what a character, what a great interview. Let's have a great discussion. What other songs would you like to see? We have a ton of Motown artists. I've sat down with so many. Uh, let's have a great discussion below. If you like our content, we invite you to subscribe. We would love to have you as part of our community. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends.